Hi guys, I'm Nikita Ferrao, mystery and thriller author and now a true crime podcaster. Every Tuesday I put out a new true crime episode and this is the first time that I'm here on YouTube. So far I've only been recording audio versions of my podcast, but from now I'll be doing video. The coming few episodes are going to be a part of the Axe Murders trilogy. So I'm going to start it off with the Axe Murders of Velisca, then we are going to go towards the Lizzie Borden Axe Murders case and finally the Axe Murders of New Orleans. So with this, let's get started with the axe murders of Villisca. Hello and welcome to the 3 AM Fear podcast. I'm Nikita Ferrao, mystery and thriller author. On this podcast I talk about real crimes and real people. Due to the graphic nature of some of this content, listener discretion is advised. You can find the episode show notes on my website 3amfear.com. Let's get started. Nestled in the hills of southwest Iowa, Villisca was a Midwestern town in the early 1900s. It was said to be flourishing. Businesses were taking off, success was at its feet. At that time there were more than 2 dozen passenger and freight trains stopping at the depot each day. The town had several hotels, restaurants, stores, theaters and so much more. In 1912 the town built the only public armory in the state of Iowa. The armory was a storage unit for all sorts of military equipments such as guns, rifles, grenades. It also acted as a training headquarters. The town took a lot of pride in its armory but unfortunately this pride did not last long at least not on June 10 1912 It was here in this town that there lived a man by the name Josiah Moore Josiah was a prominent businessman and a proud owner and operator of the Moore Implement Company He had purchased his home in Velisca in 1903 along with his family which consisted of his wife Sarah and four kids Herman who was 11 years old, Catherine was 10, Boyd was 7 and the youngest Paul was 5 years old. Josiah's home was a traditional colonial house containing 3 bedrooms and 1 bathroom. To give you some idea of the home, once you walk in, you will be greeted by the kitchen. To the right there are two entryways, one that leads to the living room and the other is a staircase that takes you to the upper level. On stopping onto the living room, towards the right wall is a bedroom. On the top floor there is a master bedroom and across from that there is another room where the kids slept. Josiah and Sarah were well well liked by the community. They were active members of the church. They were described by the people of their neighborhood as being friendly and helpful. Now on Sunday afternoon, June 9, 1912, the Moore family was planning on attending the children's day service at the church. This was their end of the school program. The Moores had very nice neighbors Joseph and Sarah Stillinger who had two children of their own 12 year old Lena Gertrude and 8 year old Ina May Stillinger That night after the service ended Catherine invited her friends Lena and Ina for a sleepover the parents being friends readily agreed The service ended at around 9:30 p.m. after which the Moores headed home with their children and their neighbors Lena and Ina So now we are at the Moore house with their four kids along with the two neighbor kids all at the same place. It was a normal Sunday for them. The next day on June 10 at around 7:30 a.m., another neighbor, Mary Peckham, who was close to the family, showed concern when there was no noise coming from the Moore's home. This was quite unusual as it was morning and there were kids in the house, but there was no noise coming out. It was as if stillness filled the air. She headed towards the back area and found that all the chickens were cooped up. She let them out. This sparked concern within her. This was not something that was normal. She called up Josiah's brother Ross and asked him if he spoke to the family or if he had any news. Upon talking to her, he readily agreed that this was not normal. Josiah and Sarah would never do something like this and the kids being quiet was not something that happened any day. I mean a family that has kids there's going to be noise early morning evening night there's always going to be noise there's going to be chatter there's going to be people running in and out of the house so this silence this eerie silence was not normal 
not back then and not today ross soon came by and spoke to the neighbor after which they started looking for a spare key to enter the house after finding the key he entered the house and went to the back bedroom in the living room he noticed two figures covered with a sheet there was also blood on the bed frame now ross is all panicking over what he has just seen and he is horrified he just comes running out of the house and he immediately asks mary to call the sheriff ross also ends up asking mary to call up henry hank horton who was willisca's primary peace officer henry arrived shortly thereafter and searched the house after his search he revealed that the entire moore family and the two stillinger girls had been brutally bludgeoned to death The murder weapon and axe belonging to Josiah was found in the guest bedroom where the Stillinger girls were found. The weapon was partially cleaned and left leaning against a south wall of the bedroom. The news about the axe murder spread like wildfire and in no time neighbors were all out in the yard trying to take a peek and understand what was happening. Now we all know how neighbors are they get a whiff of some news something has happened good bad they are all there they want to know they want to find out what has happened they want to know whether this would impact him law enforcement quickly lost control of the crime scene and it is said that as many as 100 people had arrived at the house before the Willisca National Guard arrived around noon this hugely impacted their investigation imagine 100 people trampling around the yard trying to take a peek touching everything that's outside i don't i can't no words dr j clark cooper was the first physician to arrive at the scene according to dr cooper the group stepped into the living room and then went to the first floor bedroom while there all they could see was an arm of someone sticking out from under the edge of the blanket covered in blood there was blood everywhere and not just blood but also brains and other parts it was a brutal scene he also lifted the covers to see who it was but the face was so badly bruised that it was almost impossible for anyone to understand he also mentioned that whoever did this had left some bizarre touches to the scene we will get back to that in a minute there were a lot of things kept here and there and it and it did seem like the person was in a hurry or he or she or they were actually trying to you know kill people and flee they actually had done some good touches to the scene good in the sense for them good not for the victims but they had done some touches to the scene which left a mark saying that hey i was here and this is my mo so i'll get back to that in a minute Before that let's talk about the crime scene and how it exactly looked like. The doctor who checked the crime scene concluded that the murders had taken place between midnight and 5 a.m. Upon checking he found two spent cigarettes in the attic which suggested the killer or killers had patiently waited there before killing the family. The killer was said to have started in the master bedroom where Josiah and Sarah were sleeping. Josiah received more blows with an axe than any other victim in the house. His face was cut to the extent that his eye was missing. The killer used the blade to kill Josiah while he used the blunt end of the axe to kill the rest of the family. So you can understand the killer took the blade part and then hit Josiah while he took the other edge of the axe to kill the rest of the family members. So no other member was hit with the blade other than Josiah. Once he was done with Josiah he then killed Sarah with the blunt end of the axe after killing Sarah the killer then headed over to kill the four more kids and then the Stillinger girls now let's get to the bazaar part they first found a 4 pound piece of slab bacon wrapped in a cloth this bacon was leaning against the wall next to the axe which was believed to be the murder weapon the murderer seemed to have rummaged through all the drawers in the house to find some pieces of cloth to cover all the mirrors in the house and any of the windows and the glass in the entry doorway on the kitchen table there was a plate of uneaten food and a bowl of bloody water all the victims were found in their beds with their heads covered with a sheet their heads were beaten in like 20 to 30 times with the blunt end of an axe up in the ceiling there were marks that were said to have caused by the swing of an axe so so it's like when the killer was probably hitting them and then swinging it back the edge of the axe left a mark on the ceiling 
There was a kerosene lamp found at the foot of the bed where Josiah and Sarah slept. A similar one was found at the foot of the bed where the neighbor kids were sleeping. Lena was on the bed and her nightgown had been slightly pushed up and she was exposed. But the doctor confirmed that there was no sexual attack. But we have to remember that this was way back and I don't think that they had the necessary equipment to understand to what extent sexual attack could be. She had a cut on her knee and one on her arm which seemed like a defensive wound, the one that would come when you're trying to push against your killer. Detectives believed that she was probably the only one who could have seen her killer before she died. Sarah's shoe was found on Josiah's side and there was blood on it. But these were not the most shocking parts of the incident. The most shocking part was that all the doors in the house were locked from the inside which could mean that either the killer was still in the house hiding somewhere or this person was well known to the family. There was no other sign of break-in and there was absolutely no other way to get into the house without a key. Remember that Josiah's brother was trying to get into the house and he was searching all over for a key. If there was another way to get into the house, why would he be searching for the key? The family member's brother would of course know that there was a way to get into the house without a key. So why would he be searching all over to try to find a key unless there was no other way to get in? So this killer, whoever he was, must have been inside the house before the murders happened. The cops were expecting to find a blood-drenched killer hiding somewhere close by, so they sent out people to check out alleys, barns, sheds, outhouses, anywhere close by, because they thought if they could send out people and could just check if there was one person who was completely covered in blood or who had blood spatter on his shirt or on his pants, then that could be their killer. But after hours of search, there was no one that could be found. The Moore Stillinger funeral service was held on 12 June 1912 with thousands of people attending this service. It was a closed coffin service. The National Guardsmen blocked the street as a hearse moved towards the firehouse where the eight victims lay. Their caskets were later buried at the Villisca Cemetery. With everything that happened to the Moore Stillinger family, I can't imagine what the Stillinger girl's parents would have gone through. I mean, they just let their children stay at, a, at their friend's house, at their own neighbor's house for one night without knowing that their kids would never come back home. This is really unfortunate and devastating. Now we are coming to the list of suspects, people who may have a motive to commit this heinous crime. The first suspect on the cops' radar was Sarah's brother-in-law, Lee Van Glider. He was her sister's ex-husband and was said to be a very violent man. He had his own run-ins with the law. However, he was later cleared due to lack of proof. At 5.19 am on the morning of the murders, a man named Reverend Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly Very long name. Reverend Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly left Villisca on board the westbound number no. 5 train. When he got on the train, he allegedly told some fellow travellers that there were eight dead souls back in Villisca, all butchered in their beds where they slept. It could be a coincidence, but this was a big one because he told this when no one, not even the cops, knew that there were eight dead people in Villisca. Lynn Kelly had been there the previous night and he had also attended the church service. Two weeks after the bodies were found, Kelly returned to Velisca posing as a detective and joined the tour of the murder house. Authorities first became interested when people came forward about him. Apparently, he had posted classified ads in the paper saying that he was looking for a secretary, but not just any secretary. He was looking for a secretary who would work nude. I can't imagine. Lynn Kelly was the son and grandson of English ministers and had suffered mental breakdowns as a teenager. He had preached at churches across North Dakota, Minnesota, Kansas and Iowa. He was a visiting minister in Villisca. He was described by the people as being weird. He would take long walks at night and there were also rumors saying that he was a peeping Tom. Apparently, he had convinced a teenage girl to undress for him. So after these Villisca murders, he had a breakdown and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. While at the hospital, Kelly wrote to the Montgomery County DA 
saying he was expected to be arrested for the Villisca murders. A grand jury indicted Kelly for Lena Stillinger's murder. He was interrogated throughout the summer of 1917 while he was in jail awaiting trial. Now here I don't understand why only Lena Stillinger. There were eight people. There were the Moore parents, the four Moore kids, and the and of course Lena and Ina. But why only Lena? Why not the rest of the family members? Was it because only Lena's stress was slightly up, so somewhere they thought that he could be involved in this sexual attack? But it still doesn't make sense. Eight people killed in the same way, same house, same time, and this person was only convicted for one. Anyways, on August thirty-first at seven a.m., he signed a confession to the murder. In his confession, he said, "God whispered to him, 'Quote: Suffer the children to come unto me.'" End quote. The case went to jury on September twenty-six, and the jury deadlocked, eleven to one, for acquittal. A second jury was brought in, and once again, Kelly was acquitted in November. There was not enough proof to put him behind bars. To be honest, reading about him, everything that happened, everything that he said, it doesn't feel like he may be the one. Because if he was the one, why would he confess to only one crime, one person's crime? Why not all? I mean, he is anyways confessing, so why only one person? Many believed a man named Frank F. Jones was responsible. He was a Villisca resident and Iowa state senator. He had a store named the Jones Store. Now Josiah worked at the Jones store for quite some time before he quit and started his own store which was direct competition to his previous employer. There were also rumors going around that Moore had an affair with Jones daughter-in-law although this was not proved. But people were still talking. Now Jones was said to be a really nice guy and he didn't he was a more sophisticated kind of person. I don't know him personally. personally in the sense through reading all this uh, all the news clippings or watching all these youtube videos or news videos i couldn't exactly find anything wrong with frank so it didn't seem like he was the kind of person who would pick up an axe or he would just walk into a house take an axe and swing and kill people so he didn't seem like that kind of person but that doesn't mean that he didn't kill someone He of course had the money to hire a hitman and send that person in his place to go and kill the Moore family. Now this was the most talked about theory in town. Frank was loaded, so if it was not for him, he could have paid someone else, and this someone else was William Mansfield. He was a cocaine addicted serial killer. This is because all the murders committed by William Mansfield were done in the exact same way as the Moore Stillinger murders. his victims were hacked to death and the mirrors were covered and the killer was wearing gloves there was also a detective working on the case who thought that it had to be mansfield a restaurant owner came forward and said he saw a man boarding a train near the moors it was allegedly mansfield but that's all they had on him later mansfield did a lawsuit against the detective and won 2200 It's sad because even though he may not have been the Villisca axe killer, he was still a serial killer, and even with this, he was rewarded with money. So over and all, there was a possibility of a serial killer, a killer who had no connection to the Moore Stillinger family. There was a federal officer who was assigned to the Villisca case, and he announced in May 1913 that he believed a serial killer, Henry Moore, was responsible for the murders. Now this Henry Moore has no connection to Josiah Moore. Henry was convicted for killing his mother and grandmother with an axe in Missouri. Like the axe murderer, he too liked to cover the faces of his victims and the mirrors in the house. He also wiped the axe clean just like the Villisca axe murders. Same thing even with so much similarity, they couldn't find a lot of proof and although it did seem like the detective just wanted to close the case he just wanted to find that one small proof something to connect this person to this murder close the case shut it keep it aside so it did feel feel like you know he was trying to fit that one piece into that puzzle just just close it and keep it so this guy was definitely not the killer 
but it did seem like the detective wanted it to be now there were a lot of axe murders happening around that time because axe was a very common and handy tool available to all families almost every family had one axe in their possession making it easy to find one although this is not the case today but back then it was there were also some other popular axe murders along the south pacific railroad from 1911 to 1912 that is the unsolved axe murders of new orleans killings as well as several others as said i will be covering them in the upcoming episodes because they are really interesting and a lot is there to be said now coming to the theory that i posed a little while ago it is believed that whoever did this might have been living with the family because there was no sign of break in and there was no other way to get into the house like i said when the brother his own family member could not get into the house how could a serial killer also off from the room where the stillinger girl slept in there was a closet on the side of the room there were also several bags of cotton batting and it had marks it seemed like someone was sitting on them it was all pushed down it was like someone was sitting on them for some really long time on the bed where the girls were sleeping there was a broken watch chain piece it could be from the fight maybe someone was in the closet they escaped this person was probably sitting in the closet waiting for the right time to strike and once the right time came came out killed the family members and got out now how the person got out is a mystery after the murders the town went into a state of paranoia with families fearing the darkness at night families would partner up with neighbors and stand guard trying to protect themselves hoping that this axe murderer would not come again they even had their windows nailed shut for extra security residents openly carried out weapons after a period of time neighbors started looking at each other with suspicion for them it was like did my neighbor do this did this person do this family friend who keeps coming to my house was this is this person behind all these things so this suspicion started getting into their head because no matter how hard they searched how hard they tried to put the pieces together it didn't seem like someone from the outside could have done it there was no proof there was no way of escape so it has to be someone from the close knit community and of course the media the media left nothing to imagination rumors started to build up private detectives flooded the streets bloodhounds were brought in by law enforcement agencies but nothing could be found the aftermath of the event changed everyone's life forever no one looked at each other the same way the murders began a chain of events that finally split the small town trust between the neighbors died and this tragedy destroyed the town forever ultimately the serial killer was never found and this case remains unsolved to this date so what happened after this tragedy the aftermath after the axe murder tragedy the house went into the possession of eight people until it was finally purchased by darwin and martha lynn in 1994 they wanted to maintain the originality of the house and turn it into a historical museum he got the house cleaned up inside and he made it look like its exact 1912 self the exact date that these murders happened you can actually visit this place there and you will see that the house is in its exact self the way it was during the axe murders he found furniture and decorations to suit its old style and placed them in the exact spot as it was in the original furnishings the night the murders took place he even hung a frayed calendar with the month and year that is june 1912 the month and the year of the villasca axe murders there is also the photos of the moore family in the parlor Along with the house there are also some other axe murder stops in Villisca such as the graves of the victims Darwin Lynn passed away in July 2011 his wife Martha auctioned off the contents of the Olson Lynn Museum in 2012 but kept the axe murder house open as an attraction the house was added to the national register of historic places now a little more bizarre part about the axe murder house some believe the house is haunted with the moors and the stillingers A lot of paranormal experts and television ghost hunters have visited the place since then. Some even said that they could feel a presence there, while some have reported hearing children's voices when no one is around. This includes whispers, banging noises, moving objects and more. 
One story even alleges that as one individual tried to enter the attic, an unknown force prevented her from doing so. When the house was investigated by the Travel Channel's ghost adventure crew, they captured the recording of a man who said, "I killed six kids." The house made headlines in November 2014 when one of the overnight ghost hunter guests stabbed himself for no apparent reason. There are countless more stories from where this came from. There are a lot of stories you can actually go online, you can go on YouTube and you can check and there are a lot of people who have gone into these houses, shot videos and even have recordings of voices that they could hear. The Villisca Axe murder case, which is said to be one of the most horrific crimes in American history, remains unsolved. So guys, what do you think about the Villisca Axe murder case? who do you think would be your primary suspect if you had to think about who committed this crime what do you think do you think it is one of the family members do you think it could be someone who was invited into the house who was sitting in the house or who was living in the house that night but the brother did not know about this person or do you think that it was just a random serial killer who was passing by and thought that let me go in and kill this family or do you think that this was a strategy and someone was there someone who knew everything about the moors and decided that i'm going to wait and i'm going to kill because it doesn't explain the batting in the house i mean it doesn't explain the marks that were left behind by the person it seemed like this person was sitting there and actually waiting for this family not just you know it was not a random break in it didn't seem like a random break in but do you think it's possible do you think it's possible that this was a random breaking because i honestly don't think so but please let me know in the comments if you think that this is a random break in or this was just a serial killer who was crazy enough to murder so many people and leave behind all these clues the bizarre clues so who do you think it is someone from the house someone from outside or someone from a totally different state who was just passing by and decided that this is the next house i'm going to attack so let me know in the comments what do you think If you like this video please do share and subscribe I'm going to be putting out a lot more videos and I love unsolved cases I really loved unsolved cases because they have so much mystery within them so a majority of the cases that you're going to see in this channel are going to be unsolved but that doesn't mean I'm not going to be putting out solved cases I'm going to be putting out solved cases because once in a while I do want some closure of my own so I feel like unsolved cases and solved cases have their own ins and outs So you're going to see a few salt cases too in this channel. Thank you guys for being with me so long. Have a happy week and stay safe out there. That's it for the day. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to follow me on social media, especially Instagram. The links are in my description box. You can also find the episode show notes on my website 3amfear.com. If you love reading thrillers, you can now check out my free ebook available on my website. Once again, thank you so much for being here today and see you next week. Have a great week and stay safe out there.